Hey everybody, my name is Diana Mayfield and I am on the content and community team here at Design Files. Before I uh, introduce Megan to you, I just want to check if everybody can hear me. So I'm going to pop into the group really quick. And if you can hear me or if you can't hear me, give a comment let us know. I'm going to assume that you can hear me since I don't see anybody saying that you can't. So awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I am here with my friend, Megan Dolly, who is a fractional CFO and accountant for interior designers and architects. Megan has over 18 years of accounting experience and is specialized in working with interior designers over the past 12 years. She helps designers create meaningful tools to go beyond barely used financial statements, see what the future holds, and how to achieve their goals. At the end of our chat, we'll open it up for Q&A and do our best to answer some of your guys' questions. But for right now, let's welcome Megan. Hi, Megan. How are you today? I'm great, Diana. Thanks so much for having me. This is going to be fun. Awesome. Looking forward to jumping into it. So let's dive right in. This is a very complicated uh, topic, accounting and bookkeeping and financial statements. So to start off, what is the difference between a bookkeeper, an accountant, and a fractional CFO? And when designers are ready for help, how do they know which one of these to hire? Okay, so yeah, you're right. It can get really complex and to the point where people are like, oh, I don't even want to talk about it. Like this just this stuff stresses me out. So hopefully what we hear today is where we like get you the information that you need. And that's what I like to concentrate is like, what do you need in order to help your business? Right? Okay. So you're, I want you to think of everything on a timeline, right? Like mm -hmm. there's, here's a timeline and this is today. And so okay. your bookkeeper is going to take everything in the past mm -hmm. and put it in the right buckets. It's going to organize the things that have already happened, right? Okay. And, and then there's also the component of like uh, your CPA or your enrolled agent for your taxes, whatever, whoever you're using for taxes. They're also using the information historical that your bookkeeper has cleaned up in for compliance, right? Mm -hmm, well, mm -hmm. then we get to this point where all of this stuff gets to be really ugh, drudgery to do because it's not like new information, especially for a lot of interior designers who work in small information, small companies, you have a small business. This information isn't necessarily useful to you. And so all this bookkeeping ends up being compliance work, which sucks because it's not stuff that drives your business forward. Okay. It's stuff that helps, but it's like, eh, really? It's for someone else. It's not right. for you. Yeah. Right. Right. And so once we move beyond today and the stuff that makes people nervous, the, the, especially business owners that where they can't sleep at night because they're thinking of the things and all the things that they ought to be doing. And am I going to be okay? This is the realm that a CFO is going to work in. They look at the resources that you have, what's coming down the road, what you're going to need. Are you going to be okay? What's your cash balance going to be three months, 12 months from now? Mm -hmm. So that we can have that that um, that forward looking instead of reacting to what has happened, we are planning for what is what what we want to happen and making sure giving you a better shot at that actually happening. Okay, cool. So that's the the CFO or the fractional CFO. They're more forward focused, projections, goal setting, budget setting, strategy, not just get your ducks in a row for the government. Right. Right. Okay. It's the fun stuff. It's like I get to live in a fantasy land. I get to play what if all day instead of being like, where does this $2 transaction go? <laughs> oh, yeah, I get it. Now I get it. Because like your LinkedIn says not a bookkeeper. You're like, <laughs> I'm not doing bookkeeping. Got not it. Doing bookkeeping. <laughs> okay, very cool. So that helps too for designers if they if they don't have those ducks in a row yet, or they're putting those ducks in a row themselves, they're ready to not do that anymore, then they would know, okay, I need to hire a bookkeeper. But if they're at the point where they've got all that compliance stuff figured out, but they don't understand, you know, really how to set their goals and their budget, then they would know, okay, now it's time for me to consider 
working with a fractional CFO. Right. Um, that line awesome. that I like to draw is like, so if you're DIYing your books and you're good at it and it's fine and everything's working out great. But if you are DIYing your books and you're spending five hours a week dreading doing it and it's got like all of this mental energy that you're experiencing that you're spending on your books, it might, it's, it's time to hire a bookkeeper mm -hmm. and get help with that. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Um, so in terms of hiring a bookkeeper, how can designers kind of know, um, you know, when they're ready financially, like what is a, what is a ballpark figure? Because I know talking with you a couple years ago, I was like, I don't think I'm ready to hire you know, a bookkeeper. And then it's like, oh, actually I was. So I think a lot of times small business owners can um, assume that they can't hire a bookkeeper, but actually it might be more affordable than they think. So what's the ballpark range, you know, because you mentioned the kind of emotional and exhaustion side of it, if it's causing you pain, um, but on the financial side, how do you know you're ready? So uh, cost, right? Like cash flow is everything at this point. Um, dirty little secret is that your income statement and balance sheet really don't matter when you're a small business. They just don't matter. There's no surprises on there. Um, so really it's cash flow. Is the cash flow going to allow it? Um, the other side of that is if I am not the one that has to do this anymore, is that going to free me up to go get more revenue? That's one way that you could pay for a bookkeeper. But then there's like, how much would a bookkeeper cost? And that all comes down to frankly, how many transactions do you have in your business every month? And the fewer transactions that you have, the less it's going to cost. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, like, um, how detailed do you want it? Like, is it okay for just journal entries to come in and do a general quick and dirty reconciliation? Or do you want to be able to use the detail detail? So there's a lot of different components that go into hiring a bookkeeper and how much you're going to pay. And certainly do not hire the first person you come across, get quotes. There are huge companies that do bookkeeping. There's, you know, solopreneurs that do bookkeeping and every size in between and every price point in between. You could probably have your books done quick and dirty for $250 a month. But if you have lots of transactions, lots of detail, lots of hand Hand holding for your clients for specific payment terms, lots of tracking that goes on. You can pay, you know, depending on your size, but as a solopreneur, you can pay upwards to $1,500 depending. Mm -hmm. Okay. So probably compared to other service-based businesses, designers, you know, might have to pay a bit more because if they're purchasing products for their clients, right? So they could have more, like, because they'd have product purchases, not just um, getting paid by class yeah. for the project fee, right? So there's right. a little more technical. And it depends on like how automated can can you can the bookkeeper get it to be, right? The more automated that they can be, like uh, oh look, vendor X that automatically goes into account Y, the software can do that for you and that's going to cost less. But if there's a lot of tailored transactions, very unique transactions, or mm -hmm. you want them to be tracked in in your book specifically by client and not just in your design software by client, that's going to be more expensive. Got it. Okay. Um, and so for the designers who, you know, do want to DIY their bookkeeping at this point, what tools do they need to make it happen? Uh, start with the end, my, end goal in mind, right? Like we want to get paid. <laughs> we want to get paid the right amount and on time right? Um, if you have a system for that and that is happening, great. Um, I'm, I'm, a minimal, I'm a minimalist when it comes to tools. Like literally, I started using QuickBooks in my personal business, not for my clients, but for me personally, only like three years ago because I was using wow. Excel and yeah. it was good enough. Like literally at the end of the year, I download all of my transactions from my bank into an Excel sheet, run a pivot table and send it to my tax account. And it literally took me an hour a year to do my books because, right? So, I mean, yeah. what, what do you want to get out of your bookkeeping? If you have a lot of AR that you want to track, like the invoicing and you want to be able to um, track down deposits and track down specific invoices and making sure that the deposits are being charged correctly right. um that's uh, then you'll want that's where you want to start getting a tool you don't want to be tracking invoices on different excel tabs that gets that gets nasty if you have more than 10 mm -hmm. clients that you're doing on an excel tab it's time to use something like wave or quickbooks quickbooks is really the workhorse 
Um, some people use Zero. That's a little more friendly for accountants than for people who are DIYing it, though. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, got it. Yeah, that's that's great to know about the Excel. You know, if there's anybody, um, you know, watching today that like they're kind of just getting started, and it's like you don't want to be spending all your time trying to be a perfect bookkeeper while you're trying to grow your business. So just that knowledge that you know, if you have a small amount of transactions right now, it is probably something that you could do annually. With it. Right, right. Because really what matters is the amount of cash that you have in the bank account and is that number going up. <laughs> right. Love it. <laughs> Love it. Um, okay, cool. So let's talk a little bit about um, collecting and reporting sales tax. Uh, this is something that can be complex within the interior design world. So if a designer, you know, takes a project on that is out of state, how would they determine what sales tax that they should apply to that project? Well, you can thank my home state of South Dakota for this uh, Nexus rules and Amazon. We went ahead and sued Amazon because we wanted our sales tax money. Um, so this is what's called Nexus. If you don't reside in a state where you are doing business, the rules are different for every state and it can get it can get complicated. So really, if you're not if you're not doing more than one hundred thousand dollars in another state, you don't have to worry about this question. Hmm. Wow. Or like some states are like 200 transactions or one hundred thousand dollars is kind of like the, the baseline. But a lot of them are a quarter million dollars and not a number of transactions. So it really, truly depends on the state. If if you find yourself going across state lines quite a bit, like, you know, 10%, 20% of my business is from over a, another state, one in particular, that's when you're probably going to want to look into the nexus rules mm -hmm. for that state. Um, if you're getting bigger and you're, you have states all over the place that you're doing business and it's time to look at a tool such as or a service such as Avalara. And uh, Dan, I think you have a link there. And they actually, this link that we have for you is will show you exactly state by state what type of nexus that you might have to have. It might be a number of transactions. It might be a certain amount of top line revenue just done in that state, not overall, like quarter million dollars for your business overall, but quarter million dollars in that specific state. Um, if, you, if you open up an office, in another in another state, you you'll definitely need to get a sales tax license in that particular state. So there are different rules, and Avalara at this link they do a really really great job of explaining every type of nexus, and you can look at the link for that specific state. And they they use regular words, <laughs> <laughs> regular words. Yeah, words. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. So I did drop that um, in the chat. When we're talking about nexus, though. Um, and talking about potentially hitting over $100,000 in a, in a different state, is that service too? That's not just like it buying products. On okay, it depends on that state, right? Because sometimes you don't have to charge tax on services for most states, right? Yeah, there's a lot of states that don't have tax on services. We do. Okay. We have tax on, we tax everything because we, we like our sales tax money here in oh. South Dakota. So um, yeah, there's a lot of states only tax services or, or only tax products. Um, but there are some okay, that got it. So that's again a statewide, whether it's the service or the product, that's again a state specific thing. Um, okay, so there was a specific question that comes up often in chat that I want to ask um, in you know in our live chat at Design Files. So if a designer purchases a product at a non-trade or a non-tax exempt local retailer, the store, you know, might charge the designer tax on the purchase and then the designer will bill the client for that product. So should the designer then include that tax when billing the client for the product? Or is that something that they are supposed to pay, you know, themselves? I guess that's, again, a statewide question. But have yeah. you kind of run into any moments where it's like the designer versus the client would pay certain taxes? Yeah, that one that one's going to get complicated by state because in South Dakota here we'd call it an excise tax where you would tax on top of the tax, but in other states you've already paid the tax and there's a spot on the form where it would say like okay, 
I already paid the tax on this. So like it'd be a non-taxable sale. Um, very, very dependent on the state that you're inside. So I can't give you a very specific answer for that. So. Mm, yeah. Okay. So um, now we, we've got the Avalara um, link and that, and that goes state by state, right? So they mm -hmm. could actually look within their state there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So if you're in Alabama doing business in Georgia, go ahead and take a look at what the rules in Georgia are and see if you meet those thresholds. Okay. And then in terms of like getting somebody to help them, if they want to go kind of beyond like researching it themselves, would these sorts of questions fall within the bookkeeper, the accountant CPA, or the fractional CFO, if they wanted to like, you know, talk to kind of a consultant about this sort of stuff, who would that person be? If you have a really good bookkeeper, they might know the rules, but generally your CPA, the person that's more in the compliance world, the one that does the government documents is going to know this. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Um, so another kind of, um, issue that can come up is the purchase orders. So, you know, nowadays it's easy for designers to just log into their trade account on a vendor website and order their products online instead of, you know, creating a purchase order. So for bookkeeping and accounting processes, are purchase orders better? Is there any sort of value to continue to create POs? Or is it fine to kind of do things more like a consumer would and just, you know, buy things online? Yeah. So if you look at the original purpose of a purchase order, the purchase order is, is, is a contract. It's like, hey, I am going to buy this thing at this price. And it's an agreement between the vendor and the purchaser. So first, the purpose. So if you're going on to your vendor's website and buying it at a price that's on the website, that you don't need to protect yourself from the invoice that, that's coming later. And I'll said, hang on a second. I said I was going to pay $1,500 for this, and this invoice is for $3,000. So if you're buying it on a website for the original purpose of the purchase order, you don't need it. On the other side, like the books are not for your bookkeeper. They're not for your account. It's for you. If it is helpful for you to have purchase orders for every item, you're going to pay more for the bookkeeping because that's an extra layer that they have to go in and match the invoices, receive the items and match it to that purchase order and get all three pieces of that documentation all lined up together. Um, and if that is helpful for you because there have been problems or just because you it, it makes you feel better, great. But if, if you're like, nah, I'm good. I know what I bought. I know what client it's going to. And we good. We're good. So it's not for the bookkeeper. It's not mm -hmm. for your accountant. It's for you and what works for you and what, what are your needs? Mm, got it. Okay. Um, another question about taxes. <laughs> um, so when, if a, if a designer allows their client to use their own credit card to purchase like under the designer's account, and their tax exempt number, like how would that affect sales tax? Do you recommend designers don't do that or? Um, so they're going to the vendor. Let yeah. Me so if the client right. designer lets the client use their own credit card at a, at a vendor's website with their own, you know, designer discount and tax exempt number. Somebody's going to have to pay sales tax on there somewhere. So they're, they are either going to have to invoice the client for the sales tax portion above and beyond what they've already paid the vendor. Mm -hmm. um, but you, know, you want to talk to your tax expert yeah, about that. That's another sure. one that's How to the CPA. That's a CPA yeah. one. Okay. They want their money. And frankly, I don't know that that's even uh, kosher. Yeah. Because okay. they don't have the agreement with the vendor. You do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's see if there's any, we'll get to Q and A at the end, but I just wanted to check if there was anything that was specific to, um, not tax stuff, not, <laughs> to, not tax. Let's move on. From <laughs> we'll move on. Um, so let's talk about like collecting payments from clients. Is there any sort of um, best practices that you recommend interior designers use to make sure that they're, you know, never out of pocket. Um, again, in, in the service world, interior design is more complicated because it's a service that's all about products. 
and buying products, right? So how do designers make sure that they're, you know, not putting themselves at risk with, you know, out of pocket costs? Step one is to have the conversation about money early and often. Get really, really comfortable about talking about money with your clients. If you if you're like starting a proposal and and you're feeling like I don't want to talk about the money part, they're going to ask about money. They're going to ask about money. Work through that, right? Like we want to talk about money as freely and openly as if we were talking about our kids. Okay, so that's step one. That's step one to protection. The other one is to be very clear about your terms. If you're expecting upfront payment, if you have a deposit, if you're using a retainer model, whatever that is, but to be um, have it in writing, have the understanding and making sure that you are having that verbal com verbal conversation with your client about the terms, not just, hey, I'm going to send this over. I want you to take a look about no, it'd be sitting down and say, OK, so just so you know, I have a fifteen hundred dollar retainer. And so before I get started, I'll need to check for that $1,500. And the rest of this is going to cost about $35,000 for the job. Mm. A thousand of this is going to be for design. 15,000 is going to be for, um, you know, product that just very, very detailed conversation of how things are going. I'm a huge fan of taking a big deposit up front and before I do any work. And so that I'm like literally paid, my clients are literally paid for the work that they're going to be doing and the product that they're going to be buying. So they're not trying to collect on the back end. Yeah, that's great. And this connects to that other question asked about, you know, designers allowing clients to use their accounts. And in the chat, um, you know, Charlie's mentioned that, you know, you shouldn't allow clients to do that because obviously there's your own time and money involved and it undermines other designers. But I think we probably get that question because people are trying to find a way to not put themselves out of pocket. Right. So they're like, oh, I'll just let the client use their card. So I don't have to worry about it. So this idea of the deposit um, is a is a much better and probably more ethical way to handle that. Um, and. So would you say like you base the deposit off of their budget or would you base the deposit off of the specific items that were approved in the design? Like where does the deposit come in this process? So upfront, right? Like we're going to sign off when you sign off on this. I'm going to send you an invoice for $2,000 for the first month worth of my design work. And then I'll have more detailed. It really comes to the point where you are. Um, I don't want to say comfortable because I do want you to, if you're not comfortable with it, we're going to get you outside your comfort zone in asking for that money. Um, but uh, just so that you are not being paid in arrears, you're not billing them for yeah. things that you've done already, but you are taking a deposit of this is the budget. And I don't want, I, I don't need all of it up front. Maybe it's 20%. I'm going to take 20% mm -hmm. now when that's used up, I'm going to bill you for X, Y, or Z. Um, depending on your cost of goods sold, like for your product, if, what your margin is, the skinnier your margin, the more I am going to want in my pocket before I make that order for you. So if it's like, you know, it's a, if it's a sofa that I'm paying $7,000 for and I'm selling for $10,000, I'm going to want a 70% deposit on that sofa. Mm, that's good. Okay, cool. So yeah, and obviously the deposit depends on how they structure their services because um, an e-designer, they might take, you know, 50-50 of just their services. But if you're doing more traditional design services and ordering things for your clients, then you need to consider, you know, the budget of the products being purchased. Yeah. And there's such, you can do a hold back as well. Like if you're like, um, if you're doing billing ahead of time, uh, if you have in your terms that there's a 10% holdback that the client is allowed to take until everything is signed off at the end, the punch list is completed, all of those things, um, that the last 10% is due after punch list is completed, that's fine too. Just so mm -hmm. that they have that feeling of protection on the client's end as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I love what you say about comfort, right? It's, it's a comfort of like, you know, your worth and your value and what you bring to the table as a service provider. And it's like, yeah, I'm comfortable charging part up front. Like to get to that point is super important. And I think, 
I don't know. How, how do people, how do the people do that? They just have to go for it, right? You just, you know, you I've, never come across, I've never come across a really successful client that um, bills and arrears. Right. Like to the okay. point where when people get to that level of, of success, people are like, here, take my money. And it's not like it's it's an authority position to demand your money up front and people respect it. If you frame it correctly, you stand in your power behind it. You're confident in it. And it's like, oh, yeah. Like, right. that's, that's just the normal totally, thing. <laughs> totally what we do. That's just what yeah. we do here. Love it. Um, cool. So let's talk about some of those um, CFO things. And this is, uh, again, complicated and hard to cover in a few minutes, but how can designers learn from their financial data in order to grow their business? How can they move past, I've got compliance covered, now I want to learn things. I want to set better goals. I want to set a better budget. How do they do that? Yes. Okay. So the missing question that people forget to ask is when, right? We ask how much all the time, but mm -hmm. not really the when. So if I'm going to invest $5,000 in a program and I expect a $20,000 return from what I learn in a program, um, when, right? And the same thing is true for, for your cash. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, your business is meant to serve a purpose in your life. And people lose track of this, especially when they're comparing themselves to other businesses. Oh, I need to grow. I need to be bigger. And we lose track of like, hang on a second. Why am I in business in the first place? And so the first thing that I do with my clients is like, I'm trying to figure out their, their real goals, their goals behind the business goals. What does it mean for you personally to be able to bring home $10,000 a month? What, what, what are we going to do with that money? And it's giving the money a job. So while we look at our income statements, we're like, yeah, no surprises there. Like when's the last time you looked at your income statement? You're like, oh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Yeah. Income statements are meant for big businesses that have departments and they want to make sure that all of their departments right. are functioning the way that they're supposed to. They so have no like, idea what's happening. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. There are no surprises on your financial statements, meaning they're not really that useful. There's like, I've never come across a balance sheet with a new client that was right. Mm. It doesn't change the way they do business to have a correct balance sheet. So it doesn't matter. Mm. So what I really want people to look at is their future cash flow, right? Like the, where's the cash coming in from? It could be revenue. It could be AR that's never been collected. It could be loans. It could be selling assets. It could be investments. It could be all of these places that cash is coming in. And then all of the places that cash is going out. And when, when is the cash coming in? When is it going to hit my bank account? Plot that out for as far forward as you can. What money am I going out, is going out the door for my employees, for my overhead, for shiny objects, for experiments, for product, for taxes, for marketing, all of these things. And when, and then we get to the number at the bottom of this is how much cash was, is going to be produced, we think, in this time period. Um, and how, what am I going to use that for? So before the revenue even comes in the door, you know what is being used for overhead, what is being used for marketing, what is being used to pay myself, and then what is being used to like protect the business, and what is being used to like get me towards the goal. Those uh, okay. top three goals are always sitting at the bottom of my client's cash forecast, always, okay. always, so that that house on the lake is on there, the retirement, the debt payoff. And so we can see how the contribution of the business is flowing to me to benefit me and my family. Um, so we're not losing sight of that. And so that all of those other pieces still, still fit in our eyes, still on the prize. And if something's out of whack, we can see it ahead of time. We can see it three months ahead of time. Like, whoa, whoa, I totally mm -hmm. forgot that January is the worst month of the year. And I forget. And it, comes back to bite me in the butt every year. Oh, I forgot about taxes in April. That's always so <laughs> painful. You know, those yeah. things that we can see ahead of time and how it's going to affect the cash balance. If your cash balance is going like this, that's fine. But really, mm -hmm. we want it going like this. So I can't mm -hmm. make camera slowly up, yeah. one, you know? Yeah. And then we're going to be using that cash. Sure, it's going up. I can't backwards through that cash balance <laughs> is going up. Yeah. 
but how do we put it to work? How do we give it a job so that when that time comes, the cash is coming in the door. It's not like, oh, I forgot about this. And then right, right. is going to get wasted. Yeah. And, and I love that. It's, it's like that projection thing that it's like we hear all oh, financial projections, but how many people are actually doing that? And when you do that, then you see oh, this money is is precious, right? I need to protect this money for my family, for my goals, for that vacation house or the kids college fund or whatever it is versus, you know, we're just doing things month to month, moment to moment. A cool course comes. We're like, oh, let me try this new marketing thing. Oh, sure. This conference, like it can just kind of get all over the place. Whereas if you have projected, you know, this much money is supposed to go for these specific goals, then you probably feel like, do you find that when clients are doing that, like, does it help them vet expense decisions? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it's the difference between being reactionary and being proactive. Like, are you planning this out or was it a knee jerk to something that may not matter a week from now, but it sure felt like the end of the world this week? Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so is that basically like a closed schedule? So you have a closed schedule, let's say, you know, 15,000 comes in for a month and you put, you know, 5,000 into your, this bucket and 3,000 for that bucket. Like, is that kind of a projection when you're talking about the lake house and the this and the that? Is that items on a closed schedule? Um, so a closed schedule is like the to-do list at the end of the month of what okay. we want to be done. And maybe that those allocations are on your closed schedule. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's also part of that is being able to see the progress towards the goals. Cause sometimes we forget, sometimes we forget about progress. Like I have a, I have a friend who lives down South and she's been saying for years, I'm going to move to South Dakota in three years. She's been saying this for 10 years in three years, I'm going to move to South Dakota mm -hmm. because she just expects that three years from now, she's going to be in a different place, but she's doing nothing in the meantime to protect the progress that she would have made like, okay, I think I need to pay off X, Y, and Z. I'm going to need a hundred thousand dollars to move to South Dakota. It's not going to magically appear in three years. Mm -hmm. And if you're constantly seeing that amount in your bank account and you, it, it, your, your mind uses different buckets, right? And it's hard to focus on all the buckets at the same time. So it sees this, this bank of cash. Mm. It's like, Ooh, I have extra cash. I'm going to use it for and you forget right. about the goal. And so instead of protecting progress towards your goals, you're using that like, oh, this is going to get me closer to my goal because it's going to do, it's going to help me do this other thing. Well, hang on a second. You already have this money towards your goal. Protect it. <laughs> yeah, that's huge. That's major. So what is like the, what is the kind of, document or like what are some of the documents that people would create in case they want to like google this for more information so it wasn't i'm it's not a closed schedule but what are, what would like somebody put that on it a financial projection what are the, some of those words that they could kind of google to yeah, figure out so, those, um, those formats you could use financial projection is a good one okay. i i've kind of tailored my own i haven't been able to find quite the right tool so i have a cash calendar that i create for my clients. And so they can pretty much see their money as if it were on a calendar and mm -hmm. look forward to, okay, so seven weeks from now, I know that I'm going to have this influx of cash, but oh, whoa, 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 wait, on a, wait hang on a second, because I know in three months, I'm going to need that because that's that month that is generally pretty dry. Or they're like, oh, hang on, you know, my, my safety blanket number, that number, when you look at your bank account, you're like, Phew, I'm yeah. good. Yeah. I'm over my safety blanket number for quite some time. I'm going to take some of that money out so I don't waste it. And I'm going to go put it towards extra towards my goals. Um, ah. Yeah. So there are cash projections and it's, it's real, it's, it's, it's simple um, for somebody like me. It's easy, but it's the components are simple. Mm -hmm. It's cash in cash out. Yeah. What's left over. Yeah. And then we go back and we compare how close was I to my guess? What did I miss? Um, what did I get right? And then adjust for the next time around. And it's, we get closer and closer and we learn more and more every time we do it. Mm, love it. Um, yeah, that's huge. I like the, the concept of the calendar too, because it's like visual. Um, so I'm going to hop inside of the chat now and see if we have any questions. Um, 
you know, oh, wait, well, before I do, just I, I forgot one of my own questions. We kind of covered it, but maybe there's some more we can go into. But like, how can they take this to learn from their finance, to, to grow their business? How can they learn from their financial data to grow their business? So before we go into q and I, I was a little ahead of myself here. We talked about protecting our money. How can we use these these insights to grow our money? So this is where it might get a little harsh, but this is where we need to learn that we're weak, right? So if we are looking at our results versus what we thought would happen or what we um, were expecting to happen, um, we want to know where we're weak. And many times it comes from your variable expenses and your fixed expenses. Uh, variable are going to be a more um, uh, efficient or more variable expenses. If you can get your... Okay. I'm, I'm sorry to throw some accounting terms at you. I really try not to use accounting terms because I think the industry itself already has enough gatekeeping. It doesn't need more. So two types of expenses, okay. expenses that are directly tied to your revenue. Like um, the more product you sell, the more product you have to buy. So those expenses are going to go up directly related to the product revenue that you're bringing in. Okay. Um, the fixed expenses are like, whether you have sales or not, you're going to have to pay this, this expense. Right. Okay. Got it. So, um, being acutely aware of of those fixed versus variable, and keeping those variable as a percentage as low as possible. Right. That's that's one lever that you can pull. Going through like an expense audit, I always I used to cringe when I would be like, okay, we're doing an expense audit. I would cringe on behalf of my clients, but the on the other other end of it, they're like, I had no idea I was spending on that. Go through your line by line expenses, whether on your bank statement, your credit card, whatever it is, go through line by line um, and line it up. Line up what you're spending and take a look. You'd be surprised how many people don't do this. Um, so be comforted that if you don't do it. 90% of other business owners don't do it either, but it's really illuminating and you can find a lot of places to cut some expenses. On the other side of that, like what's enough for you? Mm -hmm. Don't necessarily be scaling because everybody else is doing like, what is your enough number so that you're not scaling up and beyond? Some people even scale beyond profitability because their expenses are rising too fast. Um, right. And find that, that sweet spot for yourself. Uh, if you want to grow and you're like, I need to hire somebody because I'm, I want to grow. There's the, make sure that you are figuring out if you are hiring, how much revenue that person can help contribute to the business and when like, mm. how they're going to take them to get online, get up to speed. Yeah. yeah. Yes. That's, again, that when, that when moment is really great because like, you know, girl boss world. I mean, I, of course we have men on our live stream too, but this, <laughs> this girl boss world is very like scale, scale, grow, grow, you know? And so outsource, outsource, like there's a lot of shame. And like, if you're doing it all yourself, you're doing it wrong. There's like so much shame and in, in not outsourcing. And so people can just like, okay, I got to outsource this. I got to outsource that. But the when question is really good. Like, okay, if I, this outsourcing X, Y, Z is a fix cost, when will it pay for itself? Or when will it bring me 2x ROI? So mm -hmm. um, that's, that's a great point to bring the when moment in and, you know, compare your variable versus your fixed costs and how each of those will, you know, kind of contribute to ROI and kind of especially watching your fixed costs when it comes to calculating potential ROI. Yeah. So I don't know if I totally answered your question, but um, yeah. I guess my my final answer on mm -hmm. that is uh, set your best guess. It's science. It's art. It's all an experiment. All of business is just an experiment. Set your theory. I think I can do this revenue by doing these expenses. And then don't forget to check against that. Okay. Yeah. So, have an experiment, check whether it was valid or invalid rather than just willy nilly, just keep yeah. trying things and without track it somewhere. Like a like, check and balance. You have a check and balance yeah. in place. If you don't put down that idea of what you're experimenting, you forgot that it was an experiment and then it lands on your expense every month after because you forget about it. So make sure that, like, okay, 
going to try this new program. I'm going to try this piece of software and I'm going to come back in two months and see if it did what I think I thought it was going to do. That's major. Most small business owners are not doing that. So that's huge. That That's a lot. I love it. Um, okay. So now let's look into some Q and a, um, I am going to scroll up here now. I, we probably won't get to everything, but I just have to say that unfortunately. Okay. So let's see. <laughs> One question is how do you manage when you invoice a client and order product in one year, but the manufacturer does not ship and charge you for that product until the next year? So would, I mean, would it just go into the, the next year as mm -hmm. a, as an expense? It, it depends. It depends on if you are filing your taxes on a cash basis or an accrual basis, okay. you can recognize that expense regardless of if you have the invoice or not, if you're trying to, well, unless you get audited, but you can accelerate that purchase order. This is where a good case where you would want a purchase order. Like I sent him this purchase order um, and you accrued that expense already this year. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, I mean, income statement wise, it matters. These are the year end things that you can kind of massage. You can call your vendor and say, hey, I need an invoice for this by the end of the year. Um, it's this is where your income statement really doesn't matter. It's cash flow. It's cash flow mm -hmm. that matters. Mm -hmm. When are you getting paid versus when do you have to pay? Um, I think that question applies only specifically to a tax situation because cash flow, it, it, mm -hmm. the only thing person it matters for is your government. Right. Okay. Yeah. So it's, you know, if they're not concerned about the cash flow of it either way, it's kind of just whatever's more, whatever makes more sense. And then if you are going to include it for this year, make sure you have a PO or some sort of proof for it. Yeah. And you can, um, yeah. Okay. Um, so let's see, what are some things that you can do to decrease your taxable business income every year? How can we okay. decrease our taxable income? Big old asterisk on this answer, right, right ahead of time. Okay. I come from a farming community where at the end of the year, you will see the farmers go out and buy a new $80,000 truck in order to spend or save $20,000 in taxes. Okay. And then they still have to pay eighty thousand dollars for a truck right well and so they're net they're out sixty thousand dollars to save twenty thousand dollars it doesn't make sense unless they are in need of a truck if they're in need of a truck great um so do you need it you can anticipate your needs if you know that 2021 was a really great year for you mm -hmm. um and 2022 isn't looking too hot in your backlog yet you might want to find out like, okay, in 2022, I am going to need X, Y, and Z. Um, there are other things that you can do. And this, these are great conversations. Actually, this is, might be a litmus test for going out and hiring a CPA for your taxes. Okay. Ask them about the Augusta rule. If you can rent, you can rent your house to yourself from your business for free for two months a year or two weeks a year, right? Mm -hmm. so, um, you get to claim the expense on the business side and you don't have to claim the income on your personal side. Um, if you are over $80,000 tends to be the threshold for filing as an S corp mm -hmm. versus a sole proprietorship. Yeah. There's a little bit of savings to be had there. Um, funding your retirement account is a big source of tax savings. There's a lot of little things that you can do for your taxes. And these are conversations. This is why I like meeting with my tax person three times a year. Once in, in January, February, when we're doing the taxes for the previous year, in June, when I have a feel for how the year is going, and then in early fall, September, October, before we're getting to the end of the year, and I'm like, oh, crap, I need to spend more money, or oh, oh nuts, um, wh what's going on with taxes? I don't have the cash to cover what I expect to have with taxes, just to keep that conversation open, and what are going to be the right tax savings for me personally. And I want him to look at the whole picture, not just my business, but the personal side as well. Mm -hmm. and, they, and he does a really good job of pointing out, okay, hang on. Now there's, if, if we move some money over here into your taxes, or if we go do this other thing, there's going to be tax savings to be had there. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And it's also like, do you want to pay less taxes or do you want to pay yourself more back to the truck example, you know, because it's like, if you're concerned about paying taxes, well, that means you're, you're 
having more expenses and then you're not paying yourself what you could right. have paid yourself. So some people might have, you know, sort of a ceiling limit that they put on themselves because they're thinking, oh, I can't make more than this because I'll be in a new tax bracket. But like, just don't make assumptions. Just check. Is it actually worth it to just pay those taxes? Don't be afraid that there's some mysterious tax bracket like actually yeah. look into where you are because you might have more room to grow. Right. And that tax Probably. bracket, this is a huge misunderstanding of what a tax bracket is. Like if you go up a tax bracket, it doesn't pull all of your income into that tax bracket. It pulls that little bit that goes over the line into that next tax bracket. Mm -hmm. So don't screw the pooch on this one. Don't go spend the $80,000 on the truck to get you out of this tax bracket because you might be tying yourself to cash flow, cash flow, <laughs> cash flow issues for the next five years as you have to make those truck payments. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. That's great. Um, okay. Super good to not make assumptions. Oh, one more thing on that point was the retirement account. Um, if you want to like put more into your retirement account, make sure to talk to somebody that you have the right one. Um, because for most people like a solo 401k, you could contribute more than a SEP IRA. That's just an example, but like talk to somebody, if you want to have a higher expense for your retirement, like make sure that you're figuring out how to max that out. Um, let's see. Another question is, do you re recommend using an invoice or a sales receipt for designer retainer fees? Uh, well, are they, and maybe I wonder if that's a bookkeeping question, like using the invoice or the sales receipt for your bookkeeping or for your client? I'm not quite so sure. So your invoice would be for if you are sending somebody an invoice and you need to make sure that you're tracking the payment of that invoice and the collections mm -hmm. of that, like they're mm -hmm. sending it and not, not like paying it. Um, some people have it like where it's tied to their, their, their calendar and they're like, oh, here's the link or here's, here's the contract and the link for payment and it's all the same together. So in QuickBooks, the answer is it depends. Are you tracking a long-term invoice that you're waiting on that deposit? Then you'll need that invoice. But if they're paying it right away, you don't need to make the invoice. You can just take that sales receipt straight to the bank account. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That might be a question from an e-designer. Maybe they have a website where you can just like buy right away and they can just use a sales receipt. They don't need an invoice. Correct. Yep. Okay, cool. Um, let's see here. Dun, dun, dun. Okay. If I am making up a large purchase item like cabinetry, do I invoice my designer fees slash markup on a separate invoice or create a PO for the cabinetry with my markup included? Uh, how is it, how did, what is your understanding with your client that you had at the beginning of the contract? Like, did you, does it say in your terms or did you have the conversation of, you know, uh, whatever the cabinet fees are, I'm going to add 10% of that. Or did, was, was it like, um, it goes back to, it depends. Yeah. It, what do you think it, is the more normal way to do it? Cause they said, if I do it that way, wouldn't I carry the tax burden for the cabinetry and do I file it under cost of goods? So in my mind, you're in your client would see one line on their invoice for cabinets because nobody's going to, I don't think anybody wants gonna... to see my cabinet cost plus the upcharge that I'm going to put. Yeah. On you don't want to put that in. You just want to. The sales tax should be charged on the whole amount that you are okay. charging to the end client. So even if you're buying the cabinets for $20,000 and selling them for 25, the 25 is what's taxable. Okay. I mean, that makes sense because you think if you owned a furniture store, if I bought wholesale items and I sold them, the person pays the sales tax on what I'm charging them, not on what I bought it for. So yep. it's the same thing for a designer. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so they just collect that sales tax with, you know, that payment from the right. client. And then they're in charge of submitting that sales tax. Right. If you want to play the game, with it, you could actually put that upcharge into your design fees instead and have it flow through as just zero profit on all of your product. Um, I think that's that's really messing up your what you're able to see, how you're functioning in your business for those upcharges. So like the amount that you're saving on the on sales tax that the client is paying isn't going to outweigh the benefit of you being able to see your true design charges versus the upcharge on your product. 
Mm, okay, so you're talking about like rolling those up charges into the design fee. Yeah, yeah, but the long term you're screwing the pooch and you're not the one that's paying the sales tax anyway, your client is. Okay, so how, what do we, what would you say is like more common? Uh, design fee is truly your design fee and then product usually has the upcharge on included in it. Okay. Um, let's see. Another question is, are there any design industry gross profit benchmarks for services, product and sublet work? Is there a net profit percentage guideline for a design company? So like that you want to see gross profit in services versus versus product, a net profit percentage guideline. Have you seen something like that? Uh, yeah, so this is going to depend on your level, um, how many employees you have, how many transactions that you have, like the smaller business that you are, the bigger the margin you want to have. Um, wow, this, this could be a really involved product. Like if you want a, a quick and dirty and it's not necessarily industry related, like Profit First has their 15% for tax, 10% for profit, 35% for owner pay, and the rest goes to OPEX, depending on what your revenue level is. Yeah. Um, um, the the more successful interior design firms that I've seen have at least a 35% margin on their product. And on in terms of people, I always use the, word, the rule of thirds. Um, if you have uh, interior designers or engineers or anybody like that, that is working directly and charging hourly for for that design work that is being purchased like their 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 work is truly cost of goods sold for that design fee that you're charging um i don't want it to cost any more than a third of what the client is paying hmm. okay that's a good that's a good margin love yeah. it <laughs> <laughs> gotta have those good margins right yeah okay let's see um Okay, so somebody asked who would create a cash calendar for us? Would an accountant be able to create a cash calendar? Now, I think that's something that you've kind of drummed up, right? Yeah, that's kind okay. of my baby. Um, they they do cash flow projections. <laughs> Frankly, here's here's the thing about CPAs and the bookkeepers. I love them dearly and they play a huge role in my life because Lord knows I don't want to do what they're doing. There's a reason I don't want to do what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Um they like their gold star for being right. And wow. with the cash projection, um, it's really hard to, to get that A plus and be oh, yeah. really right. <laughs> personality really thing, right? Because it's, yeah, it's, it's a, there's a certain personality that makes somebody a great yeah. bookkeeper and that wouldn't necessarily yeah. So make while person. I make my cash calendars tailored to each one of my clients, I am coming out with like a DIY cash calendar here in January that I'd be able to help you out with that too. Okay, cool. So yeah, we'll be dropping uh, Megan's info, uh, a, a freebie that she has. We're going to drop a freebie that she has in a few minutes. Um, and then if you stay on her list, then you can find out about how to make a cash calendar. Um, okay, so can we discuss tax and inventory tracking from a bookkeeping perspective? Hmm. So Boy. maybe, okay, how you track your tax liability, perhaps maybe the, the tax and inventory for products, maybe. Um, I, can we clarify the question? If, if yeah. there are some states that you are taxed on inventory and that sucks, I hate that tax. It's uh, okay. Dumb. So that means you're taxed if you, if you keep inventory without yeah, like you're it? like, um, uh, if you have assets on December 31st, you are taxed on assets and inventory is considered an asset. Um, Ooh, that's rough. Yeah, it's rough. It's difficult to count to calculate. It's it's a pain. It's a pain. Yeah, I, I wonder if they're talking maybe more about just tracking. I mean, that might be it. But what if they're talking about just tracking their like sales tax? And, and again, does that that's an Avalara thing, right? Because is that a software for? Yeah. That? So you should have soft. Yes, Avalara is a software for um, filing tax, tracking sales tax. Mm -hmm. Your sales tax should be hanging out on your balance sheet as a liability. Every time that there's a transaction that has sales tax on it, that number should go up. And when you pay your ta sales tax, that number should go down. So mixed into your bank account number when you're checking your bank balance is the sales tax that you have collected on behalf of the state. Mm 
it's not your money, but we can't see it the way that we can't really see it on our financial statements unless our sales tax liability is correct. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not very often that I see it as correct, but if you have a good book bookkeeper and things are set up correctly inside your bookkeeping software, that sales tax should, should be that liability line. Mm -hmm. Just subtract that from your uh, cash account. Another good way to do this is to have a separate bank account where you're trickling in the tax money, whether it's your income tax or your sales tax money, you trickle that in there every two weeks, every month. That's a profit first practice as well that I like. Right, right. We've got uh, Monique commenting that she loves profit first. So yeah, that's a good profit first one is having those separate bank accounts, having your separate, you know, sales tax account. And obviously for designers, when we're talking about these product taxes, that's even, you know, more important because you want, you have to track that as well as your, you know, potential income and in your business tax. Yeah. So then you're really going to want to make sure that you don't get any surprises. <laughs> because if, yeah, if you're selling expensive furniture, that could represent quite a hefty amount. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Um, so it's kind of, I don't know, it kind of seems like it would be hard for if, if designers are doing, you know, more than a few projects a year, it seems like it would be hard to do your own bookkeeping. Yeah, it depends on how complicated your um, your you transaction e design. If you do e design and you don't manage products at all, it would be you could do your own bookkeeping, doing a lot of projects per year. But as soon as you get into more traditional services um, and totally done for you services, that's where you're gonna you're gonna have a hard time to do your own bookkeeping. Yeah, and sometimes it's just it's worth it's so worth the money even if you're not making the money back to just hire that bookkeeper and have it off your shoulders mm -hmm. to free you up to mm -hmm. do it yeah to do more of the marketing and networking and all that good yeah. stuff um okay so monique is asking um do you recommend paying your business taxes quarterly or annually um, i like to i'm I'm agnostic on this one um especially if you already if you have a separate tax account already Quarterly can make it easier so that there's not such a big surprise. The government will tell you when, like, not everybody gets a choice. <laughs> if you're making enough money, the government's going to make you pay quarterly regardless. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, quarterly quarterly is fine. Um, I take my tax money and I, I put it in place in somewhere else completely that it's never going to be touched. I wish all businesses would do this. Um, it's like my rule, one rule that I do not break that tax money is not mine. And Lord knows I don't want to fall behind with the IRS. Mm -hmm. um, if it has a little tiny interest bearing, sometimes people ask, well, can I, should I invest that money? I'm like, no, you don't want your investment to die. And then all of a sudden you're on the hook again for money that you've already paid yeah. and hidden from yourself. So if you're getting zero, 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 one percent on it, doesn't matter. It, right. Like, it's more, yeah, it's more worthwhile to save it and not worry about it. Yeah. And I guess it also depends on the type of business that you are, because if you're an S corp, aren't you required to do quarterly? Cause you have to hit that 800 by March or something. Um, no, it's actually, um, so you actually don't have to be an S corp in order to file as an S corp. Oh, um, that's right. You could be the LLC. Firm. Yeah, it really comes down to the threshold for how much taxes you're paying. Like uh, if you paid, if you had a big tax bill last year, they're going to say, hey, that's a little too risky for us as the U.S. government. So right. we're going to want that's you to pay fun. quarterly so we make sure we get our funds. <laughs> right, right, right. So that's a good point. It depends on how much you paid last year. If you paid you know, more than a few thousand in taxes last year, you should do quarterly. But if it's your first year, you can do annual. Yeah. Unless they're asking for like quarterlies, there's certainly like the federal unemployment and social security and Medicare and all of those things that, yeah, you, you pay that quarterly if you have payroll. Okay. Got it. Um, so another question is, I feel like there has to be a better way to track and cross check cost of goods to client invoicing, maybe using QuickBooks as a software model. How do people do this best? So tracking and cost checking cost of goods to client invoicing, maybe kind of uh, tying those together. 
Yeah, so you could, there's a few different ways to jerry rig that in QuickBooks without, um, without upgrading because their, their highest end package is the one that has projects where you can track by project. Like this is the Diana Mayfield project and we can track all of the revenue by project. You can use uh, this new tool that they have in there called tags um, and tags allows you to do that as well. I've seen some people who actually create new accounts in QuickBooks, which I don't recommend because you have an account th um, limit that you can hit before you can't have more new accounts within QuickBooks. So you'd have like a Diana Mayfield revenue and Diana Mayfield cost of goods sold. Um, but other than that, like uh, there are uh, design files should should track that by project as well. Okay, okay. Um, with inventory, do we pay tax by the end of the year and then apply markup when sold? Um, with additional tax cost to the client. So I think talking about paying those those sales tax, do I pay tax at the end of the year and then apply markup when sold with additional tax cost to client? I'm not sure if I understand that. Um, I'm still wondering if they're in a state that charges tax on inventory yeah. held at the end of the uh, year. Maybe, maybe. Um, unfortunately, it's, oh, let's see. This is a question from Jen. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe are you in a state that has inventory taxes? Not sure. Um, there's okay. not a whole lot of states that have inventory taxes. taxes. Okay. Um, so we'll just do a couple more questions and then we will hop off for today. Um, okay, wait, she says, somebody says correct. Okay. Jen's saying correct. So she's in one of those states that has inventory taxes. So yeah, that's probably going to be need to find a CPA within that state because CPAs out of the state may not even yeah. know as well, right? For your own tracking, if you want to like internally, the government doesn't care how you do your own accounting unless you're a public company. Mm -hmm. Internally, if you want to take those costs and add it of the, the tax costs and add it to the cost of those products, that's totally fine. Yeah. So okay. you can really track like, okay, sure. I paid a hundred dollars for this, but then I had that extra 2% tax. So now it's $102. You, you can do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. All right. So two more questions for us today. Um, how can you explain? Oh, sorry. How can you explain? <laughs> can you explain how to estimate your taxes? Like how do you estimate your quarterly taxes? Um, that is that based on the previous year, that, that quarterly estimate? Uh, yeah, so they will send you a, um, it's in the mail, it, let's see if I have one, uh, it's like a payment slip, or your CPA when they file your taxes, they will give you four slips for what you need to pay quarterly next year based on this year's taxes. Mm -hmm. um, or if you just want to pay it anyway, without like, without having the requirement without the request coming from the government, I like to look at what did I pay last year? With taxes, my CPA and many of them just have it on a cover sheet of your blended tax rate this year was X percent. It was 21 percent. It was 28 percent, whatever it was. And then I'll just take that 28 percent of my profit every month. And Got it. OK. And then if they didn't work with the tax accountant last year, they can just take that what they did pay last year and kind of divide that by four. Right. Yeah. And then they would be mm -hmm. safe. Yeah. Um, okay. And so our last question for today is from Ore and it's while setting up bookkeeping for the first time as an e-designer, what should, what should we set up? Like, how do we, if it's a, you know, it's more of a simple thing cause it's e-design uh, simple in terms of taxes and bookkeeping. <laughs> um, so how would they set that up? Would that be that Excel if you can get by with an Excel sheet with eDesign, you don't have to track all of that other stuff, go for it. It doesn't even have to be Excel. It can be Google Sheets, so it's completely free. Um, as long as you can get your data downloaded from the bank in a CSV format or an um, XLS format, you're golden. Um, yeah. If you, you can watch like a five-minute video of how to run a pivot table. So what you would do is you'd bring in all of your data into a single sheet and you'd have it sort by certain criteria. You can have it, you can pick out your vendors, you can have it. Yeah. Okay, um, cool. okay, otherwise, so the, there's a really quick and dirty, there's do not, do not use QuickBooks self-employed. 
don't use QuickBooks self-employed. Don't use QuickBooks yeah. self-employed. But QuickBooks Essential, the 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 or the starter, it's a their low, their low end, not QuickBooks self-employed, mm-hmm. QuickBooks starter or QuickBooks Essentials. Yeah. Um, you can start that to talk to your bank. Just integrate those two. And you can set rules for every time a transaction comes through on Stripe, it just goes straight to your revenue and you never have to touch it. Bippity boppity boo. Yeah. And that's the so next You step. don't need QuickBooks to start out. It's like you could have really what you need is separate, a separate bank account, right? Because if you're going to download your transactions from your bank account and add them to a Google sheet, then you need to make sure you have a separate checking account for your business and then a separate like credit card or, um, a separate credit card or, or debit card, right? So then you just download they, those things and there's your income and there's your- Oh my goodness, yes. For Thank you Dana, for bringing that up. Absolutely, yeah. 100% need separate accounts for your business than from your personal. Yeah. Without question. Has from to be the separate. very beginning. So that you're mm-hmm. just starting out from the very beginning. If you do that, um, then you can easily manage it with a pivot table. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, and just one follow up question. Why not QuickBooks self employed? We're getting it's a, a couple questions on what. Uh oh. What's it? Because we're, uh oh. We're like, we're, I use QuickBooks self employed. Why not? Uh, QuickBooks self employed is a tax um, service. You cannot take the data from QuickBooks self employed and put it into a real QuickBooks file. So if your business were to grow and you wanted to start seeing balance sheets and income statements, the income statement in QuickBooks Self-Employed is not an income statement, um, and see those individual transactions, you 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 can't you can't take the data from Self-Employed and put it yeah. into a real QuickBooks. Yeah, I can attest to this. I had this problem a few years ago when hiring a bookkeeper. We had to change from self-employed to regular QuickBooks online. And so I can't see anything from those past years. It's just all brand new. Um, so basically, it don't, it, it's not going to work if you hope to hire a bookkeeper someday, which most people would, right? Most people like you hope in the future that you can hire a bookkeeper, right? Because no, most people don't want to be doing it forever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so if that's you, then you're going to want to use what the bookkeeper will use so that when they come on, they can just get started. Basically, I've only seen it used successfully one time in my entire career. There was a gentleman who he was a contractor. He sent an invoice, one invoice. He got paid once every month for $20,000. And then he paid his taxes. He paid himself and his taxes. So one transaction in every month, one transaction out every month, and then one for his taxes. And that was it. And that's the only time that I've seen that be used. Yeah. Like, oh, Got yeah, it. works Other forever. than that, it's not going to work. Yeah. Um, cool. So thank you so much. We are going to wrap up. We super, super appreciate it. I love this conversation. I learned some things. I know everybody here learned some great things. So to, you know, continue learning from you, um, I know you have this really cool freebie, which I checked out and was like, oh, this is really useful. It's called (laughs) Mental Money Buckets. Can you explain to us what these Mental Money Buckets is? I'm putting the link in the chat. what do we get with mental money buckets? So it's an awareness. This isn't something that has homework to go along with it. This is something I love brain science. I love brain. It's fascinating to me. So uh, it turns out that your brain never evolved to use money and sees money as a resource like food or tools or stuff like that. Right. Um, and so it does the same thing with money that it does for all of the other resources and tools that you have in your life. And it puts money in buckets, but it did puts different money in different buckets and you treat it differently depending on what bucket it's in. And if you become aware of these buckets, like if you're spending money in this bucket, but you could get the same result for less money over from this bucket. Now that you're aware of it, you can see it, notice it and be like, Oh, hang on, I don't need to spend that. I can just spend a little over here and get the same result. Right. And probably putting your money in the right buckets to protect your money, right? Mm-hmm. Because if it's if you have a lot of money in the wrong bucket, 
your brain's going to go, oh, that's a tool. Now I can do all this stuff with it, but you weren't supposed to do all that with that. <laughs> you forgot about the buckets over here. That were... <laughs> right. Okay, perfect. So we have gotten so many positive comments. Um, everybody's saying thank you so much. And thank you for the awesome workshop. So thank you, Megan, from everybody at Design Files. We really appreciate your time and have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much, Diana. This was a riot. This was so yes. much fun. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Bye. Bye. <laughs>